Welcome to Island Baptist Church's Rewards Bible Study, A Rewarding Life, Lesson 5. Good afternoon. Hope everything's going great for you this Sunday, that you've already gotten to see our services uh, this morning. And uh, wow, some, some interesting stuff, that deliverance, isn't it? And uh, we are certainly, uh, I, I know I'm enjoying it, I hope you are. Um, on to more interesting stuff is the study of rewards, and and both in both cases, pretty pretty spellbinding and and uh, refreshing, and a reminder that I know I need, and I I'm thinking that we all need. We're going to be in Luke chapter 19 uh, this afternoon, this this evening, and uh, we're going to be getting there for not getting there for quite a while, but still, that's going to be our. The place where I'm going to have you look, I'm of course going to be throwing a lot of things on the screen there, and there's going to be notes uh, published here pretty soon, and you'll have them. I haven't sent them over yet, but they'll be there uh, ready for you whenever this, whenever this goes online. Um, so turn with me there, uh, Luke 19, and, uh, but let's of course begin our time together uh, with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for your great grace through your Son, Jesus that has brought us to yourself and given us life, given us hope. We pray for wisdom during these dark times. We pray for direction and your hand upon our president and upon all of our country's leaders, both uh, nationally, statewide, and uh, locally. We pray, God, for what's best and what's good for everyone, Lord, and most importantly, that people would come to know you as personal Savior. We thank you. God, for the, the stories we've already heard of how lives have been changed as a result of this, um, this difficult time because people have gotten serious about what matters, and we pray that that would happen. Now, we pray that this video itself would also make a difference. We pray that our, our online services through, through this church, Lord, and the opportunity that we have to preach and teach here, God, would be glorifying to you, and that you would use them for your kingdom, for your purposes, and you would direct them and send them wherever you want them to go. Lord, I pray that you would stir our hearts together. And that we would be, even though isolated from each other, Lord, we'd be socially together. We'd be spiritually together on all these things. Open our eyes now to your scriptures. Help us to hear your voice speaking to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take off. I don't know if you know of any significant events that took place in 1815 in Europe, but I'm going to tell you about one. Uh, it was the defeat of Napoleon. Uh, you're probably familiar with his name, uh, Little, little tyrant from uh, France who basically uh, ran over all of uh, uh, North Africa, Europe, and parts of the Middle East and was, uh, could not be defeated seemingly. Well, 1815, he was defeated by a particular individual whose title, and of course the Battle of Waterloo, and we still use that term today, it was his Waterloo, we'll say that. Well, it was his final, it was his ultimate defeat. Napoleon was defeated by a guy whose title was the Duke of Wellington. Now, the Duke of Wellington was from England. He was famous for other reasons, but he was also the most famous because of his uh, very tactical, very smart defeat of uh, a very difficult opponent. Of course, Napoleon was nothing to be uh, sniffed at. And the Duke uh, has had many biographers write biographies about him, and they've used his speeches, and they've used his letters. Well, recently a biographer has come forward saying that he claims... He's claiming to have the best biography of the Duke of Wellington because not only does he have what all the other biographers had, which, which include, like I said, his speeches, his letters, and other things, uh, his effects, um, this man uniquely, unlike anyone else, other biographers, has the claims to have the Duke of Wellington's ledger, his bank ledger. In other words, how he spent his money for years and for decades in his life, and a lot of it's handwritten by the Duke of Wellington himself, and so he claims that, that that's going to tell us more about who the Duke of Wellington really was uh, than any speech or any letter that he wrote. I mean, obviously, think about it. If, um, if I'm making a speech, I'm telling you what I want you to hear. If I'm writing you a letter, I'm writing you what I want to hear, but if I write a check or if I uh, withdraw cash, I'm actually telling you what's going on in my heart. Now, um, would you ever want that to happen to you? Somebody's going to write your biography. Would you want them to have access to your bank ledger, to your checkbook, to your tax returns? 
What would that tell us about you? Would it tell us something different than you would want us to know? Hmm, that's a pretty tough question. Uh, sounds like a nightmare maybe to you, maybe to me, I don't know. But listen, it may be, that scenario may be far closer to reality than we think. Last time we were together, we were looking at this um, whole issue of rewards and in particular considering what I called the gold standard and we saw it there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 uh, where Paul talks about uh, the, 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 our lives as a building and the things that we build are either like wood, hay, and straw or they're like gold, silver, and precious stones. One, the gold, silver, precious stones can withstand the heat and the other one cannot and he says all of our works in this life are going to be tested by fire. And of course, it's not necessarily gold and silver or uh, hay and straw, but it's, in other words, stuff that's going to matter, right? And stuff that's not going to matter. Stuff that's going to count for eternity according to God's standards and stuff that's not going to count for eternity according to God's It's going to be tested, it says, by fire. And he ended that conversation in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, if you'll recall, with this, these startling words. If any man's work, which he has built, this is... The stuff you do with your life, if any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. That's pretty straightforward. In other words, if it passed God's test, you will be rewarded. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. How can I go to heaven and suffer loss? Well, it tells you right there. But he himself, notice, is not in jeopardy. His salvation is not in jeopardy. He himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now that's some pretty sobering, I would suggest to you, disturbing, startling words. So even though a person's salvation is not at risk at Christ's judgment seat, the Bema seat, remember we talked about the, the Bema seat of Christ uh, uh, last time. It's possible that a person could step into eternity with little or nothing to show for their life that they lived on here. It's possible, sets, Paul sets it out right there, for me to enter into the next life and have nothing to show for what I did in this life. Now that would not be a good thing. And maybe you're like me, your, your prospect of getting to go to heaven is so wonderful, I can't imagine needing to uh, get any more. So, so I'm going to heaven, how could I lose, right? Well, apparently you can. And if you're like me, you're in for a surprise. And the first thing we get that, that our position about this, that, that possibly, you know, like I said, the, the philosophy of, so I'm going to heaven, how could I lose? So, so what if I don't get rewards? The, the, the possibility, or I should say the, the, the definiteness, if that's a word, the, the clarity that, that our position is incorrect is first of all indicated by Paul. Notice what he says here. Why would he say this if it didn't matter? If any man's work, again, 1 Corinthians 3, which he has built on, it remains, he will receive a reward, and if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. Why waste his time telling us that if it doesn't matter? It's not just Paul that says this kind of stuff, so does John. Take a look at John, this is Second John. We've been in Second John a couple of times ago. This is uh, such a small book, we're about to use it all up. Second John 8, watch yourselves. Why would he say that if it didn't matter? That you do not lose that we, that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. So apparently John thinks, and it's in the scripture, so it's not just not what John thinks, it's what the Holy Spirit thinks, or believes, or is suggesting, or is putting right to us. That you might, that, that rewards can be gained, and they can be lost. Depending on how we act in this life. And so, so no wonder, excuse me, no wonder he says stuff like this. And we've, we've looked at this one already. Now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him. And shame it is coming. Why would it ever be shameful to stand in front of him if I'm a Christian? See, your theology may not have a room for that, but the Bible sure makes room for that. So I would suggest to you, if your Bible, dis if, your, if your theology disagrees with the scriptures, um, you got something you need to think about. You really do. So when we get to heaven, what do you suppose our greatest desire is going to be? It's a pretty profound thought, isn't it? What do you suppose our greatest 
desire is going to be. So we have this philosophy somehow that when we get to heaven, all our desires are going to be fulfilled. And I would suggest to you that isn't true because, well, because the scriptures doesn't seem, don't seem to suggest that. A lot of us have a concept of eternity and of heaven that does not agree with the Bible. I got it off a postcard or from my grandma or something like that. It's not from the Bible, though it's not going to stand, it's not going to stand the test. When you get to heaven, what do you suppose the greatest desire is going to be? A profound thought, don't you think? And, and here's another question that I think will help us answer the first question. When you love someone with all your heart, is it enough to express that love in only words? I don't think so. I would say absolutely not. Real love, listen, according to the Bible, always seeks an avenue of action. You're familiar with the 1 Corinthians 13, the, the uh, love chapter where it describes love there in action form because that's what real love is. Love isn't just me sitting over here and saying, I love you and watch you drown or starve or I don't know, get hurt in some way and do nothing. I mean, if love is an action, if it's anything, love, notice it acts these ways. Love acts in patience, if you will. Love acts in kindness. Love does not act in jealousy. Love does not brag, act in braggadocious or in an arrogant way. So, so love is an action word. It's stuff that we do. It's not just what we say. In fact, it's not what we say. It is what we do. Real love always seeks an avenue of action. Words are never enough. They never are. They were not enough for God. John three sixteen, right? For God so loved the world, he stood up there in the heaven and said, I love all you guys. I don't want you to go to hell. Please don't go to hell. No, he acted. He so loved that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Love acts. Love does stuff. So back to our original question. What do you think when you get to heaven... What do you suppose will be your greatest desire? Well, let me give you just a hint of what that could possibly be. First of all, understand this. You're going to be overwhelmed. So am I. I, mean, I study the scriptures and I, I seek to understand what the scriptures say about heaven and everything else. But I'm just telling you, I don't think we have just, but just a small portion of what it's going to be like when we stand before God and we're going to be amazed at all these done and, and amazed at his wisdom and his insight and his his understanding and his great love for us and the magnificence of his, of his plan uh, to, 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 to save us. And we're going to be overwhelmed. And listen to me, I think most importantly concerning our, our, our discussion here. We're going to want to respond to him in kind. We're going to want to respond to God in kind. So his great love toward us, and, and when we get in heaven, when we get into eternity, we're going to respond, want to respond in kind to him. And I would suggest to you very strongly that words will not be enough. Words will not be enough. Look, look at the way these elders respond to God. This is Revelation chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. And these 24 elders are very clearly humans. And we see four living creatures, and we see all kinds of angels, and of course, the Father uh, the Son and the Holy Spirit all in this throne room there in chapters 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6. But these 24 elders are not like any of the other thing. They're human. They're human. Notice this classic picture. We're familiar with all of it, right? We even sing songs about this. The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns. The Bible speaks of these things. These crowns, their rewards... They're, they represent rewards for the way we've lived our lives. These guys or gals, I don't know if they're women, men, doesn't suggest one way or the other. These guys and gals, because of the way they've served, will be sitting on 24 thrones and have 24 crowns that they have earned all by God's grace. Anybody's in heaven is by God's grace. If you have a crown, you got it because you use God's gifts and God's time and the life that God gave you to serve him. So it's all about God. Nonetheless, they took the things of God and they used it for him. And so he gave them thrones and he gave them crowns based upon the way that they served. And so notice what they do with those crowns. And they will cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you. Isn't that true? Isn't he worthy? 
Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. So now they've received these gifts from God, these, these, these rewards from God, they're going to be theirs forever and ever, and their greatest desire is what? To respond in kind, to give them back. We say, God, thank you so much. We just want to worship you. Listen, will you have a crown to throw? Will you have a crown to throw? Hear me carefully. You're going to wish you did. You're going to wish you did. And here we sit on the fallen side of life, right? Albeit saved, albeit headed to heaven, but with hardly an inkling of what that's going to be like. And we say, oh, that's not going to matter to us. Listen, you don't even know what matters. It's going to matter to us. When the Bible says it's going to matter, it's going to matter. Let it be what it is. And change your thinking. It is going to matter. You will wish you had a crown. You will, it really will. And we're going to be seeing both this evening and a couple in our studies to come, we're going to be seeing that there is a direct connection between, listen, how well you manage your life for God on earth. There's a direct connection between that and how much you will actually be able to do for him in heaven in eternity. There's a direct connection. I'm going to say it again. There's a direct connection. We're going to see in the scriptures. A direct connection between how well I manage my life here on earth and what I will be able to able to do for him in the life that is to come i will be either able or unable to do things for him in the life that is to come based upon how i handle my life here it is very clear in the scriptures it is very clear time and again jesus gave us illustration of what his kingdom would be like and he spoke very clearly of our role in that kingdom while we were here on earth and so here's the progression. Here's how it works. Time and again, there was this recurrent pattern. He, the king, would go away. It's going to sound familiar. You've read the Bible at all. He, the king, would go away and leave his biz the business of his kingdom to his subjects, to his servants, to his children, if you will, to, to those that, are, that, that he's saved. He will leave the kingdom's business to them into their hands and to his followers. And the word the Bible uses, by the way, to describe our role in that kingdom is that of stewards. What is a steward? A steward who is someone who manages someone else's stuff. So time and again, Jesus gives this illustration and multiple times in the scriptures. We see this illustration where he, the king, is going to go away and leave the business of the kingdom to his stewards. And they were to manage it for that time between the time that he left and the time that he returns, he's coming back, guys. He is coming back, and at the time of his return, we have to give an account for how we handled his kingdom and his business. Time and again, we see this illustration. There's, again, you, you have been commissioned, listen, by your Lord to manage a single asset. You're a steward. Here's that single asset. That single asset is your current life. It is your life on earth. You, that is not yours. That is his. It all is his. And you're going to be called to account for how you managed his stuff. Your life, that is the sum of your talents, your strengths, your personality, your opportunity, your material possessions, etc. They're all his. It's all his. It's so all going to be rounded up at the end, and you're going to be judged based upon how you handled his stuff. Are you ready for that? Are you ready? You need to be ready. Are you thinking along those lines? You need to start thinking along those lines. It's not too soon. It's certainly not too soon. Your Lord will return, and you will give account for how you spend his outset. Therefore, every day you should be asking yourself the question. Here's the question. How will I manage what my Lord has placed into my care. How today will I manage what my Lord has placed into my care? And let me tell you something, whether you're thinking that way or not, you're answering that question every single day. You're answering that question 
Every day, by the way you live, you're answering what you thought of God's stuff and how you would handle it. Every day you're answering that question. You surely are. Are you being shrewd with God's stuff? His life that he's given you, short, soon to be over. I told a story about a man who was headed on a business trip to Europe, very wealthy. And so he drives his Rolls Royce into downtown Manhattan, drives into the uh, parking lot of a very prestigious bank there in Manhattan, walks in that bank, they don't know who he is, walks in that bank and asks for a $10,000 loan. So, so the banker, not knowing this man, sits down and he starts working out, you know, 37 different pages you've got to sign and all that stuff for $10,000. And shows it the interest rate. The man's fine with it. He says, but I, you know, and so everything clears. He says, but I'm, the banker says, I'm going to need some collateral before I sign this over. He's back in the days before they could do background checks on, on internet and all this stuff. I'm going to need some collateral before I give you this loan. And so the man said, that's fine. He pulls out his keys to his Rolls Royce. He hands it to the banker. He says, you have a Rolls Royce? He says, I sure do. Sitting right in your parking lot. So the banker calls an attendant, the attendant comes and gets the Rolls Royce and drives it down into the underground secure parking garage that's underneath the uh, bank there in downtown Manhattan. And uh, so he signs the final piece of paper, they put the money over into his bank account, Uh, uh, he walks away, leaves the Rolls Royce, he goes away, doesn't tell him he's going to be gone. Uh, for only two weeks, but comes back in two weeks and says, I'm ready to sa- settle my accounts. Man says, well, wow, that's quick, uh, but okay. So here's what we're gonna need from you. We're gonna need, uh, of course, uh, $10,000, plus we're gonna need $17.20 in, um, in interest from you. So the man said, that's fine. He sits down and from his bank account, he writes uh, $10,017.20. And 26 check hands it to the banker the banker uh, closes the deal and then the man gets up to hands him the keys to his rolls royce and the man gets up to leave and the banker stops and says sir i have a question for you he says you came in here for a ten thousand dollar loan and and we gave it to you and then you hand me as collateral the keys to your rolls royce which you in fact do own free and clear he says i did a little bit of research on you and i found out with not with not much trouble that you're worth millions he says, why, why do you need a loan for $10,000 when you're worth millions? He says, let me tell you something, son. Tell me where I could park a $200,000 car in downtown Manhattan securely for two weeks for just $17.20. Hmm, pretty shrewd, right? How wisely, how shrewdly Will you be handling the asset of your life that God has handed to you? How wisely, how shrewdly. One of Jesus' best known parables of his kingdom and our, and our stewardship by far is the, is the parable of the minas. And that's where we are here in Luke chapter uh, 19. I asked you to turn there earlier. Luke 19. Luke 19, if you'll look down in verse uh, 11, we're going to begin the story. We're going to be looking at these uh, minas, if you will, this parable, to see what we can learn about managing the asset that we call this life. And so let's begin here in verse 19, verse, I'm sorry, chapter 19, verse 11. It says, and while they were listening to these things, he, that is Jesus, went on to tell a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So, so the king is here. Where's the kingdom? And Jesus said, listen, you don't understand the timeline. So he begins to explain the timeline and what their responsibility during that timeline is. So watch what he says. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. Who's he talking about? Himself. He's talking about the son of God himself. A certain nobleman, that's him. Went away to a distant country, that's heaven, to receive a kingdom for himself, that's the whole world, and then return to that kingdom, notice. And he called 10 of his slaves, that would be actually the word there is servant, and we could also say steward, and gave them 
10 minas, so one apiece. A mina is a worth about, well, in today's culture, worth about five months' pay. So let's say that you make $4,000 a month. So let's say $20,000 just for a round number, and that actually may be a little bit, little bit more than what a mina would be worth today. But, but just for a round number, for our sakes, and if you were with us together in our study of, of uh, Acts, we discussed this briefly. He called the ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas and said to them, do business with this until I come back. What business? Anything you want? No. It's the master's stuff. It belongs to him. So he gives you a mina. You do his business with it, don't you? And what is the Lord's business? Well, it can be anything. It's not, uh, you say, well, Pastor Bill, you're doing the Lord's business. Well, I would hope that I am. But listen, it's not just standing up and preaching. It's the Lord's business. The Lord is working everywhere. The Lord is moving everywhere. He's in everything that is truly good. And we've seen that he's going to reward everything as small as giving a cup of cold water to a servant of God. That's part of his business. So it can be extremely broad. Don't limit yourself to, if I'm not preaching or teaching Sunday school kind of stuff, then I'm not receiving a reward or I'm not handling his, his stuff, his business correctly. No, it's very broad. It's very broad. So, so and notice it doesn't come out and say what his business is here because, like I said, it is broad. Do business, verse 13, with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him. That is, it's, it, so Jesus is a Jew, right? And he's speaking of the Jewish people. And they did hate him. They sent a delegation after him and says, we do not want this man to reign over us. It doesn't matter what they think. He's going to reign over them. The, the king of the Jews is coming back to Jerusalem. He is going to reign over the whole earth from Jerusalem. Whether they want him or not. Verse 15, it came about that when he returned, notice, it's a certainty. He's coming back. After receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him in order to be, that he might know what business they had done. Here we go. This is the judgment seat. This is coming for all of us. I said, again, if we have a theology that says a Christian will not stand and be judged at the end, you have a theology that's inconsistent with the scriptures. Scriptures teach plainly that everyone will stand individually before the beam of seed of Christ. Again, you're not judged for sin there, albeit the things you do may be sinful, but your sin itself has been taken care of at the judgment seat called the cross. If you've trusted Christ as personal Savior, if you haven't trusted Christ as personal Savior, all this stuff doesn't matter. You've got another throne coming for you, and it's not this one. But nonetheless, notice his subjects, his own servants, he's calling in for judgment. Like I said, if, you're, if your theology doesn't agree with the Scriptures, you need to change. So here's his subjects coming in. He ordered that these slaves whom he had given the money be called in, to order that, in order that he might know what business that they had done. The first appeared saying, Master, your mina has made 10 minas more. So if it's $20,000 he's made times 10, that gives us $200,000. Now that's a pretty good return. Especially those of us who are watching our 401ks crash and burn right now, right? A tenfold return. I don't, it doesn't say how long he was gone. But he made a tenfold return during that term. So he turned 20000 into 200000 Now that's pretty impressive, but not near as impressive as what the king is now going to do for this faithful servant. Now notice the way the king addresses the servant. Verse 17, he said to him, well done, number one, good slave, number two, because you were faithful in very little things, be in authority, number three, over ten cities. So I'm not sure when the last time you bought anything was, or bought any houses, but if you take $20,000 turn to $200,000, that's pretty good. But it's hard to buy even one house at $200,000. But in reward for how faithful he was with the very little, that, comparatively speaking, that the master gave him, he gave him 10 cities, all the authority and all the revenue effectively here for these cities that belong to the king, they still belong to the king, but now he's able to serve the king, follow this, he's able to serve the king in a gr much greater capacity when the king gets back than he ever could before. So even if he gives us a notice, everyone's given the same here. You all have one mind, a one life. So you've only got one, it only lasts a certain amount of time, and what you do with it, you will be judged, with, judged based upon that 
in the end, not comparing you to anyone else. He's just compared you to his own standard. The master uh, will return, and he says, be in authority over 10 cities when he got a tenfold return. Wow. Wow. What a reward, right? And the second came saying, your mina master has made you five minas. And he said to him, I'll say, you are to be over five cities. So five times 20, that's $100,000, right? And for $100,000, off of $20,000, he gives him five cities? Amazing. By the way, this represents in eternity his capacity to serve the master. So he used what he had given, what the master had given him in this life for a capacity of five times as much. But the capacity that he's given in the next life is exponential, is it not? Again, I didn't write this. This is Jesus speaking. Telling us about something that we, we're a place we've never been and what things will be like in that place that we've never been. You need to listen to him. You need to listen to him. How could that be? Like I said, I didn't write this. It's his stuff. And another came saying, Master, behold your mina. So he got one, he returns one, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. Uh oh. For I was afraid of you because you are an exacting man and you take up what you, what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. Not necessarily true about him, it's just the man's opinion about the master. And he said to him, By your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. Could it be possible for us to live such a life, albeit in Christ, albeit headed to heaven, that we could live such a life in him here, having been saved, that turns out to be absolutely worthless? Hmm. By your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave, verse 22. Did you know that I am an exacting man? In other words, this is your understanding of me taking what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow, then why did you not put the money in the bank? That's pretty simple. He didn't even try. Having come, and I would have collected it with interest. And he said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. So, so the guy had made 10, now he's got 11. And they said to him, Master, he has 10 minas already. And I tell you, notice, that everyone who has shall more be given. Now here's Jesus' commentary on what life is going to be like in the coming life. Listen to him. But from the one who does not have, even what he does not have shall be taken away from him. So, wow. Pay careful attention here. This is a clear illustration, I believe, of what Paul meant, among other things, when he said that believers would, could suffer loss. Is this guy not suffering loss? So he got given a mina and he returned a mina, right? Uh, you got at least that. God's given you a life, you're going to return the life to him, that's for sure. But what will you do with that? Possibly you could do nothing and you will suffer loss, albeit still to heaven. Like I said, so as through fire, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians there, we saw the beginning of our time together. The thing that you will want to do the most, listen, is serve him there. You will not be able to. Seems to say that, don't you think? You will suffer loss when their lives, when their lives are judged down here because they did not do anything with them. Again, not that they don't go to heaven, but they're not able to do much, if, if anything, in heaven. Some guys got 10 cities to serve God with, some five cities. And again, is it going to be exactly that? No, this is, um, this is an illustration of, of the kind of thing comparing what we do and the most we can do in this life. Notice, we, we, I didn't harp on this, but let's go back to, I believe, um, I believe verse 17. Yeah, verse 17. He said to him, well done, good, and good slave, because you have been faithful in very little thing. Wow. So, so what does Jesus say about this life? He says it's a very little thing. It's everything to you, right? It's all that matters. It's all that counts. You're so concerned with it. You're so wrapped up of it. And Jesus sitting back and saying, it's a very little thing compared to eternity. Get your head on straight. Think correctly. This is very small compared to what's coming. But if you don't handle this very small thing correctly, what's coming, listen, 
will not be everything you want it to be. You could suffer loss. Again, I didn't write this. Jesus writes this. So this parable refutes several common beliefs. Belief number one, we think that God is not really bothered if we don't make the most of every opportunity. Wrong. Wrong. Clearly God expects us to take resources of our lives and greatly multiply them for this kingdom. It's very clear here. It's very clear. Common belief number two, refuted. Number two. We think that the way we spend our opportunities in this life is not, it will, have, will not have an effect on our opportunities in the life that is to come. Wrong. It will greatly affect our opportunities in the life that is. It doesn't matter how I live down here as long as I'm going to heaven. Listen, it will matter down here. Albeit you are going to heaven. Pay attention. It will matter. False concept number three. We think that if we don't serve God with what he's given us, the worst that could happen to us is that we get no reward. Wrong. Suffer loss and losing, it means losing opportunities to serve God more fully in the life that is to come. You are setting in stone based upon your behavior. Number one, setting in stone based upon what you believe as to where you go. Number two, based upon your behavior as to what you experience where you go. You're setting these things in stone forever in a small area, in a small thing as Jesus calls it here, called this life for the next life which is far greater. The thing that you'll want to do the most, listen, in heaven and eternity for him is serve and apparently, depending on how you live down here, you will not be able to do that. If you are not careful, you will not be able to do that or at least in a very limited capacity. So you see, there is a very good reason for us to ask ourselves the question, am I a 10 mina steward? Don't you agree? Am I a 10 mina steward? What does 10 mina living look like for me? What does 10 mina living look like for you? That's a question you need to be asking yourselves. Life is short. It's very small compared to what's coming. What do I need to be doing? Here's some answers some people had. For one young mother, 10 mile living meant starting a Bible study for young ladies in her uh, neighborhood, young mothers in her neighborhood. That's what it meant for her. For, for a developer, uh, 10 mile living meant rearranging his workload so that he could spend increasingly, amounts, increasingly more amounts of time providing pro bono services for uh, mission work in South America. Uh, Looks like no cost helping him with buildings and other things. Uh, for another man with a lucrative plumbing business, listen, it meant selling. It's a true story. Selling his whole business, going back to school so that he could become a pastor of a rural church. What does 10 mind of living mean? You need to ask the Lord that question. I bet he's got an answer for you. I bet he does. But we, you and I need to be asking that question every single day. How will I manage the Lord's asset today? I'm going to ask if you would, bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we think on this and as we pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray for sobriety about what's really going on around us. The big deal is not COVID-19. The big deal is eternity. The big deal is today and the asset of life that you've given to us. It's all yours all of it, all the opportunities, all the money, properties, all the abilities, personality, all that what we are, God. The sum of our life is yours, and we are stewards of it, and we're going to answer to you for it. Lord, I pray right now we would start giving you answers, and we would, we would respect the, the, the status that you have and that we have, and the one that is to come. Help us to hear you, God. Let it sink within us today, we ask. Pray your blessings over your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.